All right, so um, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to heavy ion collisions aimed at undergraduates. And um, what we really do in these collisions is melt nuclei so that we have a liquid of quarks and gluons. And what you see here on the screen is a simulation using the Titan supercomputer uh, of the incoming nuclei coming in. They they come in and then they um, <clears throat> briefly equilibrate and then the system expands and cools. And this is pretty much just a cool animation to start with. Um, so I think that most of you have some idea of the structure of matter and that as you um, look at smaller and smaller scales, you see that matter is made up of smaller and smaller things. Um, first the nuclei and then um, nucleons like protons, but inside the protons, there are even smaller particles called quarks. And what we do in heavy ion physics is look at a liquid of these quarks and gluons. So we smash the nuclei um, together and melt them. So if you're gonna be doing some research on heavy ion physics, you need at, little, at least a little bit of a base foundation in, um, in particle physics. So <clears throat> when we talk about basic particles, we usually define it with the standard model. I like this particular representation because of the animals on it. The animals <clears throat> correspond to, the ratios of the masses of the animals roughly correspond to the ratios of the masses between the different particles. So um, <clears throat> most of stable nuclear, most stable matter is made up of up and down quarks, um, Elect and electrons and not a lot else that with a bunch of neutrinos that we don't usually worry about because they go right through us. Um, but we also have heavier, um, heavier quarks, the star, the charm and the strange quark in the bottom and the top quark. And then um, this is mostly, most of what we're dealing with in heavy ion physics is the, um, is quarks. And then the gluon, one of my favorite particles. Now, when you're doing research in heavy ion physics, you're often talking not about, especially if you're doing something in experiment, you're not talking about the quarks and the gluons themselves, but what happened, what they form that is somewhat stable, um, the, the hadrons. So um, hadron is a word that um, means a stable particle made up of quarks and antiquarks. And there's two main classes of hadrons, baryons, which are made up of three quarks, and mesons, which are made up of a quark and an antiquark. Um, so these objects have to be color neutral. So you can have um, in, in your baryons, you have a red, a uh, blue, and a green color charge. And in your mesons, you have, for instance, a blue, anti-blue charge. Um, the there's a whole zoo of these so there's a whole bunch of different different types of hadrons um <clears throat> you guys are already familiar with the neutron and the proton um my favorite um baryon is the lambda and then for mesons you have the um the the pion is one of the most important but there's a whole bunch of other um stable hadrons that form um, bound nuclear matter. And feel free to chime in with questions anytime. I'm gonna assume if I don't have questions that you guys are doing okay. One of the goals, one of the main research goals of heavy ion physics is to study the phase, um, the phase diagram of nuclear matter. So um, I like this particular diagram because there's actually data points on here. And um, a couple things to point out. So here on the y-axis, this is temperature in MeV. And if you get up to here, um, <clears throat> this is about a million times the, um, the temperature of the core of the sun. So this is really, really hot. Um, normal nuclear matter um, typically is way down here on, well, actually way off scale because this doesn't go down to zero. Um, and then as we expand, as we heat up um, nuclei, the first thing that you get is this phase of matter called a hadron gas, which is mostly a pion gas. So it's just 
almost night we think it's almost an ideal gas of mostly pions and then if you increase the temperature um, and energy density even more, you get to this quark gluon plasma. Now this x-axis, you'll see this a lot. This is called the baryochemical potential. And if you've had a thermodynamics class, you may have been introduced to chemical potentials. This is the amount of energy that it takes to make an extra baryon. So most of the collisions that we talk about are way over here where the baryochemical potential is roughly zero because um, you have enough ambient temperature in the system that you're actually making a baryon and an antibaryon at the same time. So you don't need a lot of extra energy to make a new baryon. But if you get, to, um, if you get way out here, it takes more energy to make a baryon because you have to make both the um, baryon number, the number of baryons is roughly conserved. So you have to make both a baryon and an antibaryon. Why is and, it that you say it's roughly conserved? Because I always thought that baryon number was conserved. It's not a fundamental law. So um, you do see, you, you can see the number of baryons change, um, for instance, when you have decays of particles. So on short I, I believe it's through the weak decay. On short time scales, it's pretty much conserved. So in the time scale of a heavy ion collision, pretty much. But it's not, it's not a fundamental law like um, conservation of energy or conservation of momentum. It's more an observation that this is usually the case. I, uh, Christine, sorry, I think it might, I'm not sure about this, but I think it might be because, for example, like protons seem to not decay. And I think the reasons protons don't decay is because baryon number is conserved okay. exactly or almost exactly. So if like if baryon number wasn't conserved, then you might expect proton decay. And that's one of those weird, like, you know, beyond the standard model things where maybe baryon number isn't conserved, but baryon minus lepton number is conserved, some, something like that. But it's not, I think, on the same footing as like energy and momentum conservation. Oh, sure. Yeah, totally. All right. So what we want to do is we want to take these nuclei and we want to um, melt them. And, you know, if in a chemistry class, you'd take something and you'd add heat in order to, to melt it. But that option is not available to us because we need to get to very high um, temperatures, very high um, energy densities. So what we do instead is that we actually compress the nuclei until we get them so dense that the nucleon boundary is pretty much irrelevant. And how do we do that in the lab? What we do is that we take nuclei, we strip them of their electrons and um, accelerate them very near the speed of light. We smash them together. They very briefly form the quark gluon plasma. Um, and then the entire system expands and freezes. And the way I like to think about this is if you took two ice cubes in outer space and you got them going really, really fast and smashed them together, you would very briefly melt the ice cubes and then the system would expand and freeze. And this is basically the way that we study the quark gluon plasma. Now, if you, if you were trying to study water, that would be a really hard way to study water. We have easier ways to study water because we can just take a vat of water and um, put a Bunsen burner underneath it and heat it up until we get to the temperature we want. Um, but we don't have any other option available to us for studying the quark gluon plasma. So, when you do this, you have multiple phases in the collision, um, and the time scales are kind of vague because we don't always know them very well. So we talk about pre-equilibrium. So this is when the nuclei collide, but you can't quite say that you have a quark gluon plasma. Um, <clears throat> it's there's um, so you you have the interactions beginning that are going to form the quark gluon plasma. We actually now don't think we quite get to equilibrium, but that's a 
depending on what you're doing research on, that, that can either be a detail or the center of the research. Um, so then we briefly form this quark gluon plasma, which is what we're trying to study. But then we also go through a hadronic gas phase before um, the final state particles reach the detector. Um, and we have a chemical freeze out, which is when the, um, when the hadrons, when the quarks inside the hadrons stop reacting with each other to form different types of hadrons, that's the chemical freeze out. So at that point, the relative hadronic ratios are, are fixed, but then they can still have um, elastic collisions so that the um, kinetic, kinetic energy of different particles um, changes until you, reach, um, until you reach something called thermal freeze out. Um, and then the particles fly out and they hit the detector. So when you're talking about measurements of heavy ion collisions, You've, what you're actually seeing has gone through all of these phases, um, but what you're mostly trying to study is this phase right here, the quark gluon plasma. And there are two main signatures of the quark gluon plasma that I'm going to talk about here in greater detail. One is flow. So here I've stolen this animation that other people steal as well. This is actually a video of. Um, atoms in a gas expanding. Um, and what you see is that you have, uh, initially you have an asymmetric um, little droplet, but then as it expands and cools, um, instead of being um, longer in this direction, it becomes longer in that direction. So I'm gonna play that video again. Um, this feature of the collective motion of the, um, of the hadrons inside of the quark gluon plasma, we call, well, hadrons are quarks, we call um, collective flow. The other thing is jet quenching, which if you're working on me, working with me, that's what you're going to be working on. And this is that um, this quark gluon plasma is nearly opaque to any probe that carries color charge, so quarks or gluons. So as one of these quarks or gluons travels through the medium, it loses energy and, um, <clears throat> and it is significantly modified. And there's two different places in the world that we do this. One is the relativistic heavy ion collider, um, and that is in Upton, New York. Um, and the other is the Large Hadron Collider. The relativistic heavy ion collider is a little bit more versatile. It can collide more different particle species and it covers about two orders of magnitude in collision energy, whereas the Large Hadron Collider mainly focuses on um, lead-lead collisions, although it has moved to smaller systems as well. Um, and then it focuses on the highest ener energy collisions that we can make. So going back to the phase diagram, ah, so <clears throat> the relativistic heavy ion collider is 1.2 kilometers in diameter. If you ever, guys are ever unlucky enough to um, fly into JFK in New York, and if you're really unlucky and they put you in a holding pattern, they sometimes have you go out way over Long Island and you can actually see the relativistic heavy ion collider from the air. If you fly into Islip, you're more likely to be able to see it. Um, and then here you can actually see um, on the on both, on the relativistic heavy ion collider, it's above ground, so you can see it easily. The Large Hadron Collider is below ground. You can see here the Geneva Airport for scale. And here I've, they've, in this picture, you can see the, um, the outline of the Large Hadron Collider where it would sit. Um, and just for scale, this is the relativistic heavy ion collider superimposed on that picture. Between these two detectors, what you're able to do is that you're actually able to move around the phase diagram. So the relativistic heavy ion collider has an entire physics program on something called the beam energy scan, where you change the collision energy so that you can move up and down in this part of the phase diagram. And it's looking for a critical point in, um, <clears throat> in this phase transition so that we can um, map out the um, phase diagram better. <clears throat> 
the Large Hadron Collider, this is not to scale, but it's way, way up here off scale um, where it gets to much higher, um, much higher temperatures and much higher energies. Um, so let me stop there and see if there are any questions before we move to the next part, um, the, next, the next part of the talk.